So there's something so powerful on inside of you. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. This treasure inside of me. I am just clay, but I'm housing the King of glory. And I have to make a conscious decision to open wide the heavenly gates and let the King of glory come through. You are just like John the Baptist, where he was kind of a little rough. People looked at him and it's like, hey, that's some kind of crazy cave-dwelling, locust, insect-eating dude with camel fur on. It's like, and he's preaching to the nation. Yeah, and what was he saying? Prepare the way of the Lord. So it doesn't matter what the clay looks like. It matters who the king of glory on the inside is. And all your job is is to say, come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. You can do this. Shataraba. I feel Holy Ghost in here real good. That's probably why I'm getting goofy because when the Holy Ghost comes on me like this, it just starts getting, I can take no responsibility for what follows. (laughs) I love you, Jesus. So I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of it. And there has to come a point in your life where you cross a line. Because, you know, when we're younger and, you know, we know the theory, but we step into the situation, there is an actual force that makes us want to choke and and clam up. True? We've all felt it before. It's almost like something that tries to choke up. It's a spirit. Okay, And you need to provoke the Holy Ghost on you so much by stirring up your most holy faith with tongues that it comes to a point where you are not ashamed. You are so bold because you understand that it's not just a fairy tale anymore. You are carrying the one who died and rose again on the inside of you that couldn't be stopped by all the powers of darkness. And you are literally carrying him into situations that can change everything. Okay, so this last week, I have worked so hard. I did like four 18 to 20-hour days. I work in a construction business. I own a construction business. That's how I make a living. I also have a construction business in New Zealand, and I have three children, and all kinds of stuff's going on, and it's awesome. Okay? I'm, I was very tired. And my friend said, hey, do you want to go fishing on Friday? I said, yes. You're awesome. <laughs> so... What, 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 I, what I haven't got across to you is that I've been working 18 to 20 hour days and then Thursday I was planning to do a, you know, like a, maybe a 12 hour day and then drive down to San Diego where he is around 8 o'clock. An emergency came up at the last minute and I had to go out because we're down on a couple of staff and things like that. I had to go out to a job site and stay there till about midnight and come home and get ready. And I'm exhausted by this point. I'm, I'm whooped, okay? I come home, and I figured I was supposed to go straight to San Diego. I thought, you know what? I'm just going to sleep for a couple of hours, and then I'm going to drive down early in the morning because we, when we go fishing, we go out at 3 or 4 in the morning from San Diego. We go down to Mexico. That's awesome. <laughs> so anyways, I get home, and I clean up. I've got concrete dust all over me. It's crazy. And... <laughs> And uh, I, I'm so wired because you get to a point where you're tired that you actually can't sleep. You guys know what I'm talking about? I'm exhausted. I've done, I don't know, probably 80 plus hours already in that week. And it's Thursday night. Um, I get home, I clean up, I eat a little bit of food. And then I sit on the couch and I'm just trying to wind down. I ain't winding down. And then it gets to like 1.30 and I'm like, dude, I've got to go to sleep. So I set my alarm for 20 minutes. I get 20 minutes sleep, and I, I catnap 20 minutes, wake up, hating life at this point. Just going to make that very clear, okay? Just did a 20-hour day, 20 minutes sleep, now I've got to drive two hours to go fishing. Hating life, two in the morning, <laughs> okay? So I get myself situated, get all my stuff, pack it in the car, and I drive. 20 minutes sleep. I drive all the way down. I call my friend. And he's, he's half asleep, and he's, he meets me down at the marina. I say, look, dude, I'm going to pull into this little 24-hour burrito place, and I'm going to get some burritos, breakfast burritos. And then the chacha ones with the little bits of bacon and all that good stuff. PTL, diet's not happening that day. <laughs> so I pull in, and this place, we normally kind of hit this place up before we go out early in the morning. It's right down by the marina. I'm getting somewhere, guys. Okay, I just had to build that story so you understand how exhausted I was. And this has been going on for weeks. We haven't been sleeping properly. We've got two-month, two four-month-old babies. And 
My wife barely sleeps, and I'm a zombie, and it's been crazy. It's been awesome, but it's crazy. So I get down to I get down into San Diego. I'm walking into the into the burrito shop. All the lights are on. I can smell the bacon. P, thank you, Jesus. I'm super super excited. But then there's three doors, and they're all locked. Like, what's going on here? I can see the food cooking on the grill. There's nobody inside. I can smell all the goodness. Something really weird's going on. I call my buddy. I'm like, hey, dude, we're going to have to go hit up Starbucks or 7-Eleven. We're just being downgraded. Kind of bummed, to be honest. <laughs> and so I get in my car, and I'm taking off the handbrake to drive away, and then on the window of my car. And there's the dude with the headset, just like this. He's like, hey, man, you want a burrito? I'm like, as it happens, yes, I do. <laughs> And he's like, just come inside. And, you know, he, he kind of looked a little weirded out. I'm like, okay, this is, I haven't had a chance to tell you this, Jeff. It's, this one's a goodie. <laughs> this one's a goodie. So, so um, I get out of my car and I start walking towards the shop again, the, the little taco place, the little burrito place. And there's a dude that's a little bigger than me, and he's probably the same build as me, and he is literally climbing through the drive through window. It looked odd. I'm going to tell you right now, it was odd. Because I don't fit well through drive through windows. And he was bigger than me. And this, kid's, this kid, he was like probably in his 40s, and this kid looked like he was about 16 to 17, 18. This kid's looking really weirded out, and we walk inside, and I'm like, hey, um, yeah, is everything okay? And they kind of look at me like blank stares. Four in the morning. So it's just before four. It's, you know, just before 4 a.m. Nobody's around open the door, I come in, they're kind of weirding out, I tell them what I want, and they kind of walk off as if, like, I'm like, did you guys get my order, is everything okay? And then the big guy comes and he starts talking to me, I'm like, is everything cool, man? He goes, no, it's not. And he, this guy is like hardcore Mexican, so I couldn't hear everything, un- understand everything perfectly well, he didn't have perfect English, and I don't have perfect Spanish. So um, his son started translating for me, and that we started talking back and forth, and they started telling me that... Um, they start, they've got security cameras, and they started seeing people on the security cameras that looked freaky, and then when they looked where the, the cameras were, there was no one there. Like, and that had been going on for a couple of days. And this dude, like these dudes, this, this business has been there for like 17, 18 years. This dude was freaked out of his mind. And uh, they started really freaking out because the, 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 this stuff's real. Is this okay to talk about this stuff? You are a son and daughter of God. This stuff's real. Okay. And, you know, here this bozo walks in, and I'm like half asleep. I've worked for too many hours than I want to remember. I barely slept, 20-minute catnap, and then drove two hours. And all I want is a burrito. It's all I want. Leave me alone. Just shh, stop it. And I just want to eat. Because I'm going fishing. I'm going tuna fishing, and it's, I'm excited. <laughs> They start telling me the story, and they start telling me how the, like these witchy-looking demons are showing up in their camera systems, and they run outside, and they lock all the doors, freaking out, terrified out of their mind, and then this dark demon figure appears on the other side. They're in the car lot, and there's kind of like the glass windows all the way around the shop in the dining area, and a demon appears on the other side of the glass, and, and the, the son, who's real smart, says, we're sons of God, you, we're children of God, you can't touch us, and the demon responded verbally to them from the other side of the building. These guys are freaked out of their minds. And, he, and I'm like, well, and I just looked at them. I'm not saying nothing. I'm just like, yeah, you guys need help for sure. <laughs> That's honestly what I said. I mean, I'm exhausted. <laughs> just being real with you guys. It's honest and probably exactly the way I said it. I'm like, yeah, you guys are in trouble. This is not good. I think he made a bad burrito for a witch or something. You know, I don't know what happened, but it was. <laughs> just being honest. I mean, that stuff happens. So I actually, they're like, you know, I'm like, so what are you guys going to do? And they're like, well, we're trying to get hold of a pastor. I said, is that a fact? I mean, I did not look like a pastor. I had like shorts and flip-flops and a tank top. And I'm like, (laughs) exhausted. Like, yeah, we're trying to get hold of a pastor. There's a church we used to go to, but we tried calling him. He's ministering in Columbia right now. And I said, oh, is that a fact, is it? I said, as a matter of fact, I know Jesus. And as a matter of fact, God planned a couple of hours ago not to give me any sleep so I'd be here for you. Because Jesus cares for you. And I'm here to bring the King of glory with no fear and put him right here. 
See, the thing is, is that you don't know when you're going to be required to give a testimony of the hope that's in you. You don't know when you're going to be required to actually let the king of glory come out and destroy all of hell's antics. Okay? And I lifted my hands up in that store at four in the morning, Shatarababa, in Jesus' name. Exhausted out of my mind. And I started cursing that stuff, and God started showing me that a witch had actually put a curse on that shop. And I started commanding that stuff to leave. And these dudes are still freaked out of their mind. These like, but these guys are getting touched by the power of God. So I just go and lay hands on them, and they're standing behind there. I'm like, in Jesus' name, I break the curse of evil, and I, start, and I started breaking curses off their business. Because you see, I've been given authority, just like you have. Just because I happen to be the guy holding the microphone doesn't give me an extra point. I'm a son of God, just like you. I'm carrying Jesus. It's not about me having, you know, the 10th dawn and the black belt. It's got nothing to do with that. It's just the fact that I carry the one that squashed the devil's head on the inside of me. And so do you. But you know what? You know, and I, was, and I wasn't quiet about it either, by the way. I was, you know, the volume was on full, full dial and I was going at it, telling the devil where to go. And this is a true story. And I look across out the drive through window and there's this person sitting there just waiting for their burrito. <laughs> I promise you that's the truth. That is the truth. I was like laying hands on them. Shatarababa. Totally freaked out of their mind. The presence of God came so thick into that place where the devil had just been. You have to understand, I don't care how evil, I don't care if it's Satan himself, you are taking the king of glory, you have the majority. You've got to get this. Doesn't matter how hostile someone is, you're trying to share Jesus. Doesn't matter how wounded someone is. Doesn't matter how broken. It doesn't matter how dark. Oh, don't go to that part of town. That's a stronghold of the devil. Shut up, that's exactly where I'm going. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So you need to be able to take the light inside of you and get it where it's darkest. Okay, and if that's where witches are hanging out, I'm going there. Maybe they'll just have to give their lives to Jesus and shape shift out of there. <laughs> this stuff's real, man. It's the, the TV's tried to mellow it down. That stuff is real. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Okay? These, both these guys, they basically got right with Jesus on the spot. And I started prophesying about them. I said, because I, I saw, I started having an open vision over the Father. I said, when you were eight, this happened to you and this happened to you and there's a call of God on your life. And he knew it was true. And he started repenting on the spot. He said, from this day on, I'm never gonna drink again. I'm never gonna smoke again. I'm walking right with God. I'm finding a church. I'm gonna get walking with God again. Come on. Now I could have just said, give me my burrito and I'm getting out of here. <laughs> Whatever, dude. You obviously messed with the wrong witch. But seriously, this stuff's for real. And you never know. Look, honestly, I had every reason to keep my mouth shut and just move on. I was exhausted. I was tired. I was excited about going fishing. I was hungry. But you have to understand the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. Was it worth getting 20 minutes of sleep for that man and his family? Absolutely. All day long, I'll do it again. It was also worth it because he gave me free burritos, which... <laughs> He's like, and I'm giving you drinks too. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> but this man's life was changed. We always have to be ready to give an account, a testimony, to unleash heaven out of our lives because you were made on purpose and God is going to take you places without even telling you what He's doing. He's going to put you in situations and watch what you do. You know, it's like you can be like the Pharisees, crosses the other side of the road on the Samaritan. I mean, on the, the dude that got beat up. Or you can be the Samaritan that says, hey, everything stops right now. I'm on a mission from God. God has put me here and this person has cared about. And I just started telling that man, I said, listen, I'm not from down the street, dude. God sent me from two hours away. He loves you. He cares about you. And you have to understand something, that hell tries to look powerful, but it is a coward in front of the loving God that we serve. And I said, he loves you so much. That, and I told him, I said, I'm a pastor. I said, I might not look like a pastor right now. I might probably not smell like a pastor right now, but I'm a pastor. And I'm really just the son of God. And I said, but Jesus loves you so much that he sent me from two hours away to come here to make sure this place got cleared out and that you got comforted. 
And he had a powerful... You want to hear another story? Okay, so <laughs> I was probably about 28 to 29 years old, and I was living in New Zealand. I was a bachelor, and I was driving home from work one day. And I was driving in my car, and I, was, I pulled up at the lights. This one's a little full on, okay, but I'm just going to go there because it's important. <clears throat> I was pulled up at the lights, and I was behind another car. And the lights went green, and we started driving. The car in front of me accelerated off pretty good. And I watched this little girl run out from the side of the road behind a van. And this car didn't see it coming. And the, this car collected this little girl, and she bounced off the windscreen and went through the air like a rag doll. And I saw the whole thing in front of me in slow motion. I'm like, oh, my God. And I'm like, Jesus. I started calling on the name. It was bad. Like, I'm not going to paint it any more graphic than that. It was bad. I get out of my car. I pull my car over. I go running up to the girl. And I lay my hands on the side of her. And I start, in Jesus' name. Jesus, this girl needs you right now. And I call you to come. And there's four mums. Okay, now let me just explain New Zealand a little bit. Antichrist. They do not like God. They are not in favor of like praying and all that kind of stuff. They don't have a fear of God. Okay, there you go. You've got New Zealand in a nutshell. So, <laughs> so I'm praying in tongues out loud. In New Zealand, that's odd. In America, it's strange. New Zealand, it's weird. Okay, they'll probably try and lock you up for doing that. I'm praying in tongues. Shatara ba 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 ba. This girl's head has expanded out like this. I kid you not. It is bad. She does not look good. There's blood everywhere. It's bad. She was 13 years old. She looked around the circle. She started looking at the school mums because it was after school. She started looking at the school mums. I watched her. She looked, she looked up. She's like, I don't want to die. She started screaming that because she knew she was probably going to die. It was bad. She looked at the first mum, and all four mums had a look of fear and death on their face and defeat. Okay? And she started looking around each mum. She was studying each of the women to figure out where it was at. And each of the women, and this girl's face was terrified. And she was in, in shock and horror, and she was saying, I don't want to die. And I had my hand on her, Shatarabababa, in Jesus' name, I speak life over you, and I break the spirit of death. That's what I'm saying out loud. Okay, that's weird in New Zealand. It's weird in most places. In New Zealand, it's odd. One of the mums looks at me and she's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm praying in tongues. What are you doing? That's exactly what I said, I promise you. I said, what have you got to offer? I'm, I'm bringing Jesus here. <laughs> See, in those moments, you can choose to back down. And, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend anybody. Or you can just be a son. Come on, Seriously. Shut up. And this girl's looking around the circle, looking at the mums, freaking out. She thinks she's going to die. And then she looked at me, and she didn't see me. You need to get this. She saw Jesus. And the second she saw me, peace came over her face, literally like a wave. She calmed right down. I said, you're going to live. It's going to be okay. She calmed right down. And her life was impacted that day because I just merely showed up. I was traumatized. It was terrible. It was one of the most ugly things I've ever seen. Okay? But Jesus came out. You don't know when you're going to be called by God. You don't know. You just need to be ready. And you need to be decided that you're not going to be ashamed. Seriously, you just need to get over yourself, and you just need to let the King of Glory come out through. Don't just sing it in church, I'll let the King of Glory come in, and enjoy the way that makes you feel. No, you need to actually live that. Greater is he that is in me. And he that's in the, believe that. Seriously. And I found out that that girl lived and she had a normal life. I followed up on her. I mean, I walked over the side of the road. The police officer wanted to witness, uh, talk to me because I was the closest witness. And, I almost, and I'm, I'm, I'm tough. I've seen some stuff. I've had people die in my arms. I've seen some terrible stuff. And I almost fainted. I almost passed. I'm like, listen, officer, give me a second here. And I had to go sit down on the grass. I said, I just need to lay down for a second, breathe. <sighs> And I'm not that kind of person. It was, it was full on. But I made contact and I found out that girl was fine. You know why? Because Jesus got to speak through me to her. And life came and the spirit of death was cancelled. You have this treasure in your earthen vessel. And it is from God. It's not from you. Come on. You have something on the inside of you that every person in your life needs and the devil is trying to tell you that you don't matter. 
that you don't count, that you're inferior, when you are the greatest representation, you carry the literal throne of heaven into every situation you go to and all you need to do is say, glory of God, come out of me and touch this person. God is so desperately, he's desperately pent up on the inside of you looking to get into situations. He wants to get his hands, his heart, his voice, his mouth out and touch people, and you just have to make a decision. I'm doing it, God. You can have all of me. You can have everything I am. It's not about me anymore. It's about you. Come on, Jesus. Whether you're a Mexican dude that owns a shop or a little girl that's just been hit with a car, you need Jesus, and you need someone carrying Jesus. Guys, we need to be this. We need to stop playing church. We need to stop knowing all the verses and all the head knowledge and the stories and the conferences and the theology and all that. We need to start bringing heaven. It's not going to come by the next feel-good song or the thing that we do. Look, get intimate with God. Let Him wreck you, but do something with it. Seriously. Let Him out. Let Him explode out of you and change someone's life. Let Him explode out of you and destroy strongholds of the enemy. Oh, Huntington Beach is the place churches come to die, is it? That's exactly where I want to be. That's exactly where I want to be. We can have a revolution because I'm going to tell you something right now. Where the stronghold of the enemy is the greatest, that's where the greatest plunder is. Why would he make it a stronghold if it wasn't valuable? Think on that for a second. Seriously. Why would your life be such a struggle in one area if there wasn't something so valuable in that area of your life that God wants to use? Come on. We need to let Jesus get engaged. Shatara ba ba ba. Binky, binky, binky. That's, that's my baby's tongues. I'm just like, you know, binky. <laughs> okay, so I've done 35 minutes. I'm amazed. This is a God thing. It's a miracle, actually. <laughs> Someone getting something tonight? We need to let Jesus out. We need to let Jesus out. Let him have you. And just, look, honestly, the most powerfully potent threats to hell are the people that have made a decision to cross a line that have decided that they don't care anymore be that person I just need a few people in this room to really get this and we can literally destroy hell's power we can dethrone him in this territory we can put Jesus on the throne and we can have the kinds of revivals that people like to reminisce about because I love reminiscing that's great but I'm done reminiscing I want it in my hands How about you? Stories are great, but unless those stories provoke you to do something, you're just religious.